Here we go. I'm Daniel. I work for Red Hat. I'm a blah, blah, blah software engineer there. And I work in the real-time team. But I actually love to work in the university. And I actually work from my university in Pisa, where I'm living now. And uh, I'm trying to connect those real-time and Linux kernel and now runtime verification in the Linux kernel. And uh, Red Hat believed on my ideas and uh, now I'm working on this. And uh, let's see what you, you all think. So Linux is critical. There are many people saying that in the future we might use Linux on cars. And uh, as a kernel developer, I know that the kernel crashes. And the cars and crash isn't a good thing, right? And uh, another point is that Linux is complex. For later, we will see that the model for a part of the things on Linux can, can reach a number, a huge number of states. And it's even hard to explain those things using words because they might be contradictory and it's not easy to translate those things. But because of the, the critical size of Linux and, in, and the, uh, the complexity of it, we need to be sure that Linux behaves as expect. But what do we expect from Linux, right? Okay, we have a lot of documentation explaining what we should expect of deadline scheduler, for example, or the parameter T. We have many different languages. I've learned Linux in Portuguese, for example. And we have a lot of assertions in the code that say, okay, if this happens, I, I generate a warn on. You guys, nobody should use a bug on anymore. We learned that. And uh, we have a lot of test cases and fuzzing and all those stuff to, to try to check if the system behaves. And all these things are good, but we need something more robust. For example, how do we check that our reasoning and of how do we check that what we are writing is correct? And how do we check that our, no, that our asserts are not contradictory? For example, in the real-time community, we say that we do not call a scheduler when we have a preemption disabled, right? That's a common knowledge. But actually, the scheduler is called always with preemption disabled. So these kind of corner cases of understanding, it's hard to, to assert on our natural language. And how do we check that we are covering all the cases on our tests and we are expressing all the behavior of Linux? And how can we verify all these ideas? So, but the main point when we go to safe critical systems or when we go to talk with uh, mathematicians on the real-time community, for example, is that how do we convince people of our properties? Like, it's easy to convince myself, Daniel, that Linux is a good thing, you know? And it will be very easy on this audience. I would not need to explain many things, but when you go to use Linux on, on, on cars, you need to convince uh, certification authorities. And they would like something more than just a, a Linux guy explanation. And uh, what people in computer science uh, say about it when we need to, to, to explain complex behaviors, right? Stop working. People say formal methods. That, that's the first thing that comes to our mind. And uh, we have some su successful example of formal methods applied to the Linux kernel. We have the memory management, uh, the memory model that has a lot of examples and catch problems on memory model. We have some somehow formal locked app. There are many working groups using uh, formal language. For example, people on ARM, Gatli Marinas, like, he wrote the, the spin lock implementation and used temporal logic to find bugs. So we have some good examples of formal methods applied to the Linux kernel. But we need a more generic and in intuitive way for modeling other parts of the kernel or a more broad behavior, not just a simple behavior of a subsystem like memory or locking, but uh, a way to connect many subsystems on a higher level or in design level. So how can we turn this easier? Oh, 
the answer is like it's using a formal language that looks natural for us, right? And how do we naturally observe the dynamics of Linux? We trace. We have a lot of tools for tracing. We have ftrace, and we have uh, uh, perf, and now BPF, and we can do a lot of magic with ftrace and with tracing uh, subsystems. And while tracing, uh, we are inside our minds creating some, some sort of state machines. And that's natural for uh, uh, operating system developers because we, we read a lot of books saying the states of a task on an operating system, right? This, is, this, this seems to be one way to go or an intuitive way to go. Like I just copy and paste this from the gigs for gigs. Yeah, that's a very computer science name. So. So when we think about state machines and formal methods, one possible solution is the usage of automata. So we can use automata for many things, but also to specify event-driven systems. And uh, on event-driven systems, we, we see the evolution of the system as a event or a sequence of events that uh, forms the language that that system uh, you know, talks. And uh, we, we can also do use it for runtime analysis. So this is a simple example. Let's say that we want to, to, to write or to specify how a, a client, a network client, a bogus network client works. We can say that we can open and close a connection, and then we can write a, con a, a request and read the response, right? It, this is a very uh, simple case. And it, it, it's easy to read in this format. But the good thing about a formal method is that we have a mathematical description of what we specify. And uh, here, I, I will not enter in details here, but in the end, uh, one automata is an, a set of states, or, or for example, a set of states, a finite set of events, and a state transition saying that, oh, in a given state, and with a given event, what is my next state? So we have everything specified, deterministically specified. Uh, automata allows some kind of uh, implicit verification, like I can check if uh, the reason I, I'm expressing is that lock free, lock free. And it also allows the, the modular development of system by using operations, mathematical operations. And if you will try to to do an exercise on this. So this was the previous example. And we can model these as a separate set of uh, modules. So we can say that one module is the open and close. So I can open, and then my socket will be open. And I can close, and then it will be closed. And then I can be ready to write. And then I write the request, and wait the request, and read it. So very straightforward. Then I can synchronize these two uh, small models and create a big model that uh, represents all the chain of events that are possible or that might exist on an unsynchronized version of the system. There will be a set of, uh, it's hard for an Italian to speak, it could stop it and I'm, I need to move. So. <laughs> So here we have a set of events that we expect, like open, close, and read, write, and a set of events that we don't expect. Like it's not correct to write before opening, and it's not expected to close and open while we are in the middle of a connection. G this is just an example, right? So then I get events of two or more generators and put inside a small model to synchronize the operation of these events, or what we expect. So I say that I can close, again, I say that I can close while I'm not in the operation. And I can say that I can only read and write after opening the socket, okay? Makes sense? Simple. And then while modeling, there are some tools, like here I'm using Supremica, which is academic tool, but it uh, allows us to do anything I need. And uh, it says, okay, the system is blocking. This is an implicit uh, verification that, might, that gives me evidence that the system is either with uh, a live lock or a deadlock. So 
Here I, I, I take the model that is created from the synchronization of all events, and I see that there is something strange here because uh, I can, okay. I can open it, but I cannot return to the initial state. So there's something wrong with my specifications. And then what was wrong, say that I can read right after opening, but I cannot after I close it. With this all synchronized, we have the, the system I had at the beginning, right? Why? Why do you not draw it, Daniel? Yeah, that's easy. Well, why, why all these, these problems? Because Linux is complex, right? Linux is way more complex than just three states. For example, I model the behavior of the parameter T, and uh, just for the single core case, using the, the level of abstraction that I was using was not the code, it was the synchronization level, including uh, IRQ disable, IRQ enable, preemption, control, locking, and nested locking and scheduling, and so on, on the level that we as real-time developers work. And uh, I end up having a, a model with 9,000 states and more than 23,000 transitions. You know, I could write this, but not in the, in the time of my PhD. And I think I would need some pens, like some two or three to draw it. So just drawing the model by hand, it's not sufficient when you have a complex system like Linux. Using this modular approach, I could break down all the problem on the 12 generators, like small subsystem independent, and 23 specifications, which in the end are properties that I wanted to express. And uh, during the development, we found uh, actually four now bugs that would not, no, three bugs that were, could not be detected by any other tool available on Linux. So let's just have a look on, on that case, right? So I can set need reset when there is a newer higher priority thread. I, can, I have a, a task on a sleepable state. Then if I wake it up or it itself sets uh, its state as runnable, I go to runnable and uh, return to sleepable state. I can call the scheduler and return to the scheduler. I can disable preemption to not uh, call the scheduler or disable preemption to actually call the scheduler. I can disable IRQ to avoid uh, uh, IRQs, or to, while running IRQ, avoid the reentrancy because uh, IRQs are not uh, preemptible on Linux. We can get a, a task can switch in and out. And these were the generators. And now I'm starting to expressing and, and joining all those previous automatas, I would have uh, a view of all the, all the transactions. And I, I, and I would be sure that it would not be forgetting anyone. Now I start to talk the properties that I expect from Linux. For example, one property is that the scheduler will never be called with IRQs disabled. And that the scheduler will necessarily be called with, a schedule, with a preemption disabled to actually run the scheduler. And uh, I can say that the context switch will always uh, uh, run inside the scheduler, that sched need resched and sched waking will always take place with uh, IRQs and preemption disabled, and uh, this kind of well, and the necessary conditions to call the context switch, and I know it's boring. And I did it on weekends, because it was in the very beginning. It took me a while to convince Red Hat I could work this on full time. And it was summer in Tuscany. It was very boring, but <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I have to admit. <laughs> it was nice, like doing a break. It was nice to show that we have a deterministic set of instructions that, that that makes the parameter T deterministic. That was the challenge I was looking for. And that, that is one good example. Before I was talking about necessary conditions, in which I, I having the necessary conditions that event can happen or cannot. But there, is, there are also the possibility of doing uh, sufficient conditions that says that 
after one one thing happened, I am sure that uh, it will, other event will eventually happen. So, for example, after I said need reset, I will only return to the initial state after having the context switch. That is, I am forcing the scheduler, and I am blocking all the sleepable operations until there. I am just trying to find the fastest way to call the scheduler while blocking other kinds of code. Here I can abstract these are sleepable code on Linux or code that are called outside of a brain disabled section. And so I, these are the possible paths and I always return to the initial state after a context switch. This is a formal way to say that, that the, 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 there is a deterministic set of uh, events and sequence of events that will bring me the need for RISCAD to the scheduling of the highest priority thread on Linux. And that's a good property for the, to show in the, in the real time uh, uh, realm, right? So prem 30 is deterministic somehow. And uh, talking to other communities, uh, this idea of modeling, the approach of modeling and the model, it was accepted. Uh, there is one journal paper uh, on the on the review now. So yeah, that's that is how to model. That was the first part. But how do we use the model, and how can we check the model against the Linux, and the Linux against the model to try to get something meaningful for us as kernel users or developers. So in the first part of the project, I used something that is called offline uh, runtime verification in which I, the model, I'm talking first about the modeling and then I will reach in the verification. So in one hand, I start modeling with the, formal, the informal knowledge about Linux, how it works. I am a developer, I somehow know how it works and the kernel. And then I start modeling my knowledge and tracing the system and then I, collected trace of Linux, and at that time I took perf and tried to run step by step the automata with the feed from the trace from the kernel, right? Then I was trying to validate the, the model. At the, at the beginning now I, I found a, a lot of problems on my model because my reasoning was incomplex or was wrong. But at some point in time I start to see problems that were not in the model. They were problems in the kernel. And then it was the point in which we found the, these useful for runtime verification, because before I was just trying to explain the behavior of the PremTRT. So it was good, pero no mucho, in the sense that I found bugs. The automata verification, as you see, it's, it's, it's done in a good timing. We'll see this later. but. As I was tracing the system, and uh, as the granularity of the events is, was so small, I reached cases in which in a single core, for 30 seconds, I generated 2.5 gigs of data. And that's a, a massive amount of data. And I was not even uh, tracing all the functions, I was just tracing the synchronization of the system. So, what could we do to turn it better? So I translated that from an offline kind of runtime verification into an online and synchronous runtime verification. And these are the steps, and I'll explain one by one. So in the first place, we have the big model, and then I have to translate that model to something that we can uh, run on a computer, right? So I wrote a Python script that just translates the formal definition of the model into C code. Yay. And uh, here's one example of the code translation. I have the zero simple model in which I say that while in preemptive, I will not call the, I will not wake up a task. That is the necessary condition to call the schedule waking is disabling preemption. Then I just run the script and uh, voila. Uh, I translated the, the set of states into a, an enum and the set of events on one enum, and I use the classical definition of automata, and I fulfill the automata with the data from the, the I fulfill the C definition of the automata with information from the real automata. 
And um, it turns out to be very simple data structures. And we will see why it's good now, I hope. So that was generating the code. Now we will need to try to code, to link that out to self-generated code with the kernel. And so here is one of the, here is the main function on the runtime verification, which is anytime I receive one event from the kernel, like disabling preemption, I will call this uh, function telling which event I am receiving, right? And uh, here is just the information, information about the tracing where I store data. So I get the current state. Given the current state and the event I'm receiving, I'm getting the next state I'm expecting to go. If it's a possible state, I go to the next state. I might print some debug information or not. But if it's not expected, I print the debug information and like do a stack trace. I can take any action. But here's just an example of stack trace. Now going into the functions. So get the current state is a variable lookup. Set the current state is right into a variable. Get the next state is a matrix lookup. Simple things. Getting the name of the event is, is also getting the name of events and the, the states are just vector lookups. So yeah, all the operations are O of one. And this means that doesn't matter how frequently I call the, the, the event, oh, yeah, doesn't matter how frequently that will not affect. What will affect there is the number of states. Or no better, the number of states doesn't matter. What matters is the frequency that I call these, the, this verification code. And I just use one variable to keep the state. So these are good properties. And in the end, I load the model, and while running the system, if I don't find any exceptions, if one event that's not recognized doesn't happen, I can do, I can print into the trace buffer, or I can just ignore because things are, are working fine. And if some unexpected event happens, I can print some information. So here's one example, let's say that I was, that I catch, one case in which I was in the preemptive state, and uh, after disabling, I, after return to the initial state, I had the scat waking, which was not expected. And then I say, hey, there's a problem here. And this problem was a bug in the tracing subsystem. And that a bug that no other tool could catch. And I forgot to open the link, but here's the link and here's information. So, okay, nice. But we know that there is no free meal, right? It's nice to say, oh, it runs, it's O of one, blah, blah, blah. And uh, okay, I was using a not compact uh, structure. I using a vector, right? But I, I was thinking if I add any structure data, I would have to do lockups in, no, in, in O of N or O of N by the numbers of uh, events that can be called on that state. And the overhead of putting linkings and uh, other things will be too high for just one variable that I want to store there. And uh, also, for the parameter RT model, which is a, um, let's say, a, a big model, it uses only eight kilobytes of data. It's not that much. It's affordable for nowadays computer for doing verification. So it, in the end, it's acceptable. And uh, in practice, we don't need such a big model like I did. We can check just some property of the system that we want to observe. Like, it's better to have a good model, a big model, because it's more efficient, but I can just check some properties if I want to. For example, I can do while testing the latency on the parameter T, I can also try to catch cases in which I would potentially go into sleep while Ooh, I, in an atomic context, or when I cannot go to sleep because I'm either with IRQ or preemption disabled. So I could run, could try to catch uh, logical problems in the parameter T while running the, the, the performance measurement. So we can do both things at once if the thing is, uh, performs well enough, right? And that's what we see now. How efficient is this idea? Okay, it's nice to say it's all of one, my boy. But in practice, like, we, we need to see things on the, you know, on the way that we like, with benchmarks, right? So I did two benchmarks. 
Uh, I use the Pharonix test suite, which I like it, and it's good for doing academic papers because they format the outputs on SVG and we can uh, do a lot of transformation on the graphs and it's very nice. And I did test for either throughput and uh, for latency, which is the domain I like more. So the base comparison in the kernel as is, is the kernel without any trace or verification, just the kernel running. And uh, the trace is while tracing the, f the events that I'm verifying, but just tracing it, not processing, just saving it in the trace buffer. And I'm using that model in the prime 30. So when not calling kernel, as expected, it would not cause many interference, right? It, it's, sometimes it's even in the error margin. So not calling the kernel, it doesn't affect. Okay, that's expected, and it's good that things are as expected. But when we start to doing high activation on the kernel, we will see some performance degradation. That's, that's normal, right? That's what, there is more code running there. Uh, but the good thing is that the verification is always in between the baseline kernel and the tracing. And also, like you're running the latency tests with the cyclic test. Like this is the line of kernel, the, the Prems RT kernel running, and this is the line with uh, verification, and this is the line with tracing. So it causes less overhead than tracing because we are st not storing data in the trace buffers, the number of operations are bounded, they are smaller than tracing. So it, I don't want to say that tracing is bad. So, because I'm a friend of Steven, and I like him. And, uh, what I wanted to say is that this approach is efficient enough to be used in production. Because we can trace in production, right? And as we can trace in production, we can do verification as well because we don't cause m more damage than them. And uh, actually, I'm using the trace infrastructure to hook the events to the kernel while running, so I'm, I'm a trace user. And uh, this idea was also academically accepted, like I talked to them and they liked. And there are more things to come. So, uh, it's possible to model complex behavior of Linux using a formal language, creating big models from a small one, and it's also possible to verify properties of the model and uh, as Automata is a, a run an executable uh, formalism, we can also run other kinds of formalism on top of the Automata rather than on the code, like using temporal logic. And it's possible to run the, the, the verified runtime behavior of Linux. So now I'm working with uh, Steven and Arnaldo to make a generic uh, uh, subsystem, I don't know how to say this, uh, or a generic way to, to run the, the, to verify the system using automata. And uh, both with uh, perf, because there are cases in which it's better to use an offline runtime verification, and with uh, ftrace when it's better to use an online for runtime verification. Also, I, I need to explain this using, I have all these described in papers, but uh, papers are boring for this community. And uh, we would prefer to read things on LWN, because it's, you know, and I like LWN too. So we were talking to, to try to translate all these ideas into a uh, Linux kernel natural language. And uh, there are other things that we need to model on the system, like uh, parts of LockDep, for example. And the for ex because like one, one reason to try at least is that as I'm using dynamic trace, I can run all the, these things and plug and unplug. And while the system is running, I don't need to recompile if I already have the events I need. So it, it's uh, handy. And uh, I was, I'm talking to uh, Joel Fernandez. We are trying to make something with RCU and uh, trying to, to show that this idea is not only ap applicable for one case, because this, it will not be useful if it's just for my case. All right. But 
Okay, it's worth mentioning now, like I say, very many good things about the runtime verification of Linux, blah, blah, blah using automata, but I don't want to say that this is the only way and that this is the best way. It's not. It's not the best way. There are a lot of ways to model Linux. We can model on a code level and trying to explain, to explain like the, the behavior of spin logs and using like Promela and then using temporal logic to verify. That's one kind of formal model, uh, the uh, formal verification we can run. We can also have a run, runtime uh, or static code analysis that there are people find a lot of bugs and fix bugs with that. So the, the theory I'm working here is for runtime behavior for, system, for a more design level, not can be used at also code level, but it's more uh, design level thing. And uh, there is a space for a lot of research on formal methods on Linux kernel. There are many good people working on, on many good projects. There's the, the, the there's one project that verifies the drivers for Linux. It's linuxtesting.org, I think. And there are, uh, the thing with Cox now, they also based on, on uh, Julia also works on this. So there are many good people working and the more and more we will see the application of formal methods on Linux and the more we see the better, the more abstraction the better, the more ways to verify it, it's better because we don't want to cars to be crashing because of a Linux crash. Uh, something else? No, that's it. It went fine. So thank you for not sleeping. <laughs>